You are listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. What I want to talk to you about is uh, my company, DigTech. We did two massive military projects, well, massive for us, uh, last year in California, one right at the edge of the Great Basin. And while we're not ready to talk about the research for those, we can talk about our methods. Um, the prime contractor is still writing up the reports for those, so maybe next year. But what I wanted to talk to you about is how we did these projects and kind of get into that just a little bit. Um, first off, anybody that's ever heard any of my podcasts or anything like that or read anything online or heard me speak for more than 30 seconds knows that I'm really into digital archaeology and using tablets for pretty much everything. And we had a comment on one of our podcasts about the Surface Pro as a field device. And the person that commented said, oh, I'm going to listen to this. I was thinking about seeing if tablets could make me go paperless, help me go paperless. And I'm like, this is a little late to the game for that. Um, <laughs> she, this is a person that's listened to our podcast a lot. And, and I'm like, well, we've either failed somewhere or something like that. So um, that's why I wanted to give this, uh, this presentation on, on what we've done. For my company, it's pretty small. started about three and a half years ago. Um, we did two projects, and that was pretty big for us because these projects were uh, 45,000 acres total. One was 15,000, and the other was 30,000 acres. And in the two projects, we recorded a total of 250 sites. Now, these are all in California. If anybody's worked over there, they've got the uh, needlessly complicated California DPR forms, and that's what we recorded on. Uh, we recorded over 2,000 isolates. And I can't see this down here, that's why I keep looking back. Um, and over 5,000 sheets of paper is what that would about equate to when you factor in all the photographs and everything else that we took. But we're dig tech, so we didn't do that. Um, and I'll show you how. So what I'm calling, uh, everybody's talking about paperless archaeology these days, and I'm starting to call the current phase of paperless archaeology, like the phase one of paperless archaeology. And I don't mean, um, we're not going to talk about the old PDAs or doing word forms on a Trimble or early laptops that convert to tablets. That's not even phase one. That's like phase zero, pre-phase one. Um, we're not going to get into that. We're going to talk about modern phase one. So what we did, we had uh, tablets in the field. Um, the iPad first came out on April 10th, 2010. That's a little over five years ago now, and it feels like a lifetime. Um, I got one about a week after they came out, immediately started using it for field work and trying to see what works, what doesn't work. Not everything works. You can't try to fit a square peg in a round hole, but there's always ways to make it work. So we're going to talk about a few of the things that we did that helped us make that work. And one of those is an app called um, iAnnotate. Helped us do digital maps. Um, we didn't, you know, we had... I mean, on that last project, we had eight people and 30,000 acres to survey. The printing costs alone on, on maps, just printing out the survey maps every day, because um, it was on a military base with three very distinct areas that we could work. And in any one of those areas, they could have been dropping ordnance or something that day. So we had to all of a sudden, at a moment's notice, go to a different area an hour and a half away. So we had to stay flexible. And to have all those maps with us would have been nearly impossible. Um, I'm, I know people do it, but it would have been really difficult. Uh, and then printing costs in the town that we were in, it just wasn't feasible. So having our ability to have all of our maps on our tablets where our crew chiefs could just draw out our transects and have the numbers written down, you can zoom in on this stuff so you can see it really easily. Um, but we were able to, uh, I would usually draw my transects the night before, assuming we weren't going to get changed. If we were, then it wasn't that hard to, to figure it out the next morning screenshot it and then airdrop it to the other tablets for the crew members so that everybody had it. Took seconds. And then there's just some other stuff to show how easy some of this stuff is and one of the things you can do. There's an app called Theodolite Pro uh, or just Theodolite which will give you all kinds of fancy little information up there um, on all your photographs. If you've got a GPS enabled tablet which means you have the cellular antenna enabled tablet, um, you don't have to have a cell plan but the cellular ones come with a GPS antenna. It'll give you all sorts of information, um, UTMs. You can set it to the right datum, altitude, all kinds of stuff like that. And you can have that or not. You can, you can decide what imprints on top of your photographs if you decide to do that. Another app we used extensively was called TapForms. And TapForms is uh, it's the number one database application on the iPad. And it doesn't work for Android, unfortunately, but 
It's the number one database application on the iPad. We were able to create custom forms for this, and we'll get into this again a little bit later. But we were able to create custom forms. Um, we had some issues with a little bit of integration, but we've worked all that stuff out. And all of our field crews use these custom forms that we created um, in California. And we've also done it for the Nevada IMAX forms as well, and a number of other states. So that's what I'm calling essentially phase one archaeology uh, in a nutshell. I mean, it's really, it's really not that big a deal. Um, all the stuff and learning curves associated with these things we've been dealing with, you know, trimbles and total stations and all kinds of technology. It's just people see tablets and they think, whoa, wait a minute, I can't handle that. That's, that's getting a little too crazy. But it's not. So we'll talk real quick about some of the gear that we did use. So the iPad Mini 4, uh, and on the first project, we did have a couple full-size iPads, like this one, the iPad Air 1. We had a couple iPad Air 2s out there, same size, and found that it was completely unnecessary. When you put it in a big, heavy, bulky case, which you should, um, it just got needlessly heavy, it was needlessly large, you're recording mostly text, you're taking photographs, and it just didn't make any sense. So we went to the iPad Mini, which is a seven inch tablet, and we had um, just the 16 gigabyte iPads too, the smallest one they sell, because you're uploading every day. You're, you're wiping everything off the tablet every day, so 16 gigabytes was plenty, no need to spend the extra money. We had the cellular GPS enabled ones, they have fingerprint security, um, 8 megapixel camera, 1080p video if you're going to do that, and they cost about $529 new, um, $399 if you don't get the cell antenna with the GPS. We also had life proof cases on ours and OtterBox cases in some cases. The life proof ones are fully waterproof. Um, all our crews had the Zero Lemon external battery, it's a 10,000 milliamp battery, super lightweight, but will charge up the device one and a half times um, in case you need it. We never did because the batteries are ridiculous. So. And to note, in eight months of field work, eight tablets, we never broke a single tablet, but we did break one of our two trimbles. Damn it. <laughs> I mean, you fall once and it's just smash. You do that look, yeah. Um, but we dropped the tablets all the time. It's not to say we didn't. I kept mine right in my inner vest pocket. Every time I leaned over, it fell out onto the rocks every single time, so. All right, one of the other devices we used uh, pretty extensively, um, like I said, we did use AirDrop, which is a, an Apple feature to transfer things back and forth, but when we wanted to, when we finished recording a large site, everybody had forms on their tablets that they had used, everybody has pictures, you know, things like that. Um, we used this device, which is called the SanDisk Wi-Fi Connect, and it's got a little SD card in it, micro SD card in it. Um, it looks like a USB drive, but really what it is, is it creates a Wi-Fi hotspot. It does have a USB thing on it. You can plug it into your computer. But in the field, I carried one right in my vest, and my other crew chief did as well. And you turn it on, it can connect up to eight devices simultaneously. All the iPads would export their data. All the people would export their data on the iPad, upload it to this guy, and now it's in two different places for the rest of the time you're out there. So if this fails or the iPad fails, you've still got your data. So data security is pretty, pretty important for, uh, for doing this. If you can't have good data security, then you, know, you, you risk losing everything. Um, but like I said, there's ways around that. This is 64 gigabytes, took less than two minutes, probably realistically like a minute to sync everything, and then it was all done. All right. So uh, a little bit about how we created site forms from the digital data. We had a fully digital process. Um, we'll go over some of the apps that we used real quick. This is an app called Graphic. It was called iDraw up until about a year ago, and they changed it. Now it's called Graphic. But one of the neat things you can do with this app, it's a ridiculously good $9 vector drawing application. And I, I took a picture of this uh, for Junko Point, literally just like on the back of the truck. I just snapped a picture of it with the tablet, brought it into here, and then in about three or four minutes, I had the image behind that and then just zoomed in and traced it with my finger. And you can do different layers. You can do the outer edge as a layer, certain flake scars as a layer, and then change the properties of those layer and layers and mass. Like you can change the stroke, size, color, thickness, things like that. So you can you have a lot of customizable um, things that you can do. We've also done that for profile drawings, for um, plan view drawings, for uh, site drawings, all kinds of stuff. So it's a pretty, pretty powerful application. And like I said, it's like $9. So tap forms, we've got all the California DPI farms on there. Um, they're customized for field work, which means you can see I've got different 
site headers here, like that have the little triangle next to them. When you click on that, all that information sucks up and goes away, so if you don't need it, don't look at it. Um, these aren't set up the way that you're normally used to see in the forums. We did the same thing with the Nevada IMAX form. Anybody that's ever filled one out knows you don't go top to bottom. You get up there and you fill out a site organically, you know, naturally, the way you see it. So we constructed the forms that way. So the crew chief can easily go down through, and then whatever form you're on, you can easily go down through the way you would naturally record a site. Um, and we also had, this is a, a new form that came up when I, before I took the screenshot. And all that information you see there is pre-filled out in information. So what's another thing we were to do with tap forms is have pre-filled information. So if you're creating a lot of the same form with a lot of the same information, you can just put it as the default information. You don't type it in every single time. We also made extensive use of drop-down menus. It's anything with the little symbol to the right there that you can see. Um, I mean, there's a lot of information that's like, pick one of these three things or pick one of these five things. No sense in typing that out every time just to drop down a menu. And like radio check boxes and all kinds of things. One of the things we used since we were remote and my company was actually contracted just to do the field work for these two projects. The prime contractor was writing up the report, finalizing the GIS on the set records and things like that. Well, we used Dropbox, which some people complain about, but we have a Dropbox Pro account, so we have five terabytes of space, so that's not a problem. Or a Dropbox for business account. And we put everything in there in real time. Um, at the end of every day, Everything went in there. We had master inventories for all of our records. We created site records on a daily basis, which I'll get into in a minute. And um, Dropbox has 256-bit AES encryption, which nobody knows what that means, but it's really good encryption. Um, and it's secure on transfer, so there's no problem there with anybody intercepting that. And our prime contractor was able to just look at our data that we get a notification up on their computer every time we uploaded. So daily, they could see our progress and what we were doing. And if we didn't want them to see that, we just didn't put it in that folder. So the way we put all this together is with Microsoft Word's mail merge, because unfortunately, until I get to the very end of this presentation, we haven't been able to eliminate Microsoft Word, but that is my life's mission right now. So um, <laughs> the way we do this, just real quick, is you take a Word document for the form. Um, Top Forms exports as a CSV file. It's basically a spreadsheet, but read differently. Um, Exports as a CSV file, you one time merge that CSV file with the Word document with all the different fields and you drop all these things on your Word document. Now you only have to do that once and then every time after that, once we update our master files, we open up the template for say the primary form for California or the Nevada IMAX form or whatever, and then you just pick the site record you want to do and you hit merge and all your information fills in and it's done. So our step, our process for this was we would complete the field data in tap forms as much as possible. We'd have people write complete sentences. We'd have people fill in as much as they could. When we got back to the field office, um, my field director and I, we would just go through them really quickly, make sure everything was filled out properly. We'd export the data, put it on the master form, and then open up Word, the, the right form that we needed, hit merge, 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 merge on whatever site records we had, and bam, our site records are completed within 30 minutes of getting in from the field that day. So, And they were completed to probably about 99% of completion. They have a couple GIS things that were put on by the prime contractor, but aside from that, and maybe some references and some of the larger um, prehistoric, uh, larger historic sites or the prehistoric sites with uh, projectile points, that stuff was put on later, but all the field data was, was completed every single day. So that's the process that we used. Um, let's talk real quick, because everybody likes to talk about cost, if there's any CRM firms in here, and I know there's at least a few. Um, so the traditional way that this would cost is, let me recap here though. So we had about 5,000 pages worth of paper data, if we were to print all this out, uh, about 250 sites. And I know companies, not all the time, but will commonly budget about three hours for back office kind of stuff on uh, per site record when they're writing up a budget. They say, we're gonna find 250 sites, we're gonna plan on three hours per site so we can budget this appropriately. And if you calculate that out, that's 750 hours um, at an average billable rate of $55 per hour. Could be more, could be less. You're looking at $41,250. So the way we did it is I'm being generous by saying 30 minutes here. In reality, it was probably about two or three minutes for your average site that took us to create the site record. 
but averaging out over some of the longer, more complicated sites are ones with, you know, if you're familiar with California forms, had a lot of linear feature forms or, um, you know, something like that, then we had to, or a lot of features, we had to put them on continuation sheets, we had to create all that, so that might take a little longer. So the average, we'll say, was 30 minutes, but it was really way less. It just made the math easy. So that's 83.3% time savings, which equates to 34, almost $35,000 in cost savings just for those two projects. So. so, to finish up a little bit here, phase two. Phase two is what I'm calling, well, I'm calling phase two anyway, um, is going to be an app called Codify, okay? Um, it's born from the Center for Digital Archaeology. Uh, they're out of Berkeley, and Michael Ashley is the guy who runs that, and he developed Codify as an application that can pretty much do everything. They've been using it on academic projects across the world. Um, and when I saw this two years ago, when he presented at a conference at the SAAs, um, I, uh, that's their logo, which he has tattooed on his arm, so you can believe it works. Um, <laughs> so when I saw him present this at a conference, I met with him and then went over to his offices in Berkeley, and we've become good friends now, and I said, Michael, this is great for academic projects. You have to build Codify each time for them because academic projects start from ground zero every single time they go out. Um, and, you know, he's doing these, uh, Chad Ohuliuk and these big projects in Australia and, you know, he's got Turkey and, and Israel. And, and they're all like these, these one-off sort of things, but they're, the underlying architecture is Codify. And so we talked about doing that for CRM. And one of the things that I realized working in 18 different states in the country was that so while sites may have different definitions, um, meaning how many artifacts or features make a site or something like that, it was really just mathematical definitions. And the stuff that you actually record, regardless of the state you're working in, is pretty much the same, right? Um, you're recording stuff about the environment, about the soil, about the artifacts, about features, and you know, location, stuff like that. So what Codify is going to be is, and it already kind of is right now, we'll get into that, but what Codify is, is we intend for someone to never see a form in the field. We intend you to basically enter data in, in a logical format. Based on when you first get to the site, you say, I've got this, 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 and this, and then the system presents you with your options for recording those different things. And Michael came up with the idea of calling it the TurboTax for archeology span because um, TurboTax, if you're familiar with that, or any tax making software, you never see the form. You answer questions, and it produces the form at the end. So what we're doing, we're answering questions, we're filling in site data, and then at the very end, the very last thing you do, after you've checked everything, is hit make the form, and boom, you've got your form in whatever state format that you need. So, um, the idea is to record simply and efficiently, um, export as needed and as often as needed. Uh, it's gonna have error checking uh, capabilities. Check in, check out of forms, and basically what that means is all the tablets are not connected together, but um, can read each other's data without connections pretty easily. And that's a proprietary thing we're working on a patent for, actually. And, but basically, I find a site, or my crew finds a site, we flag it out, we've got eight features, 15 diagnostic artifacts, I've got all the people logged in on my tablet as a crew chief, and I say, okay, you, you're getting this, 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 and this, you're getting this, this, and this. We transmit those forms, forms out to everybody. They record what they do, they can find extra stuff, create new forms, just like you would normally, and then give it all back to us at the end of the day. And not only that, but they've got a little nice little handy graph that's showing them their progress completion. So that's kind of a little bit of gamification there. They, they like to see, you know, how much is finished. Um, so this is going to have also end-to-end uh, -end project management from proposal to hiring, field mobilization, field work, um, survey, set recording, excavation, field demobilization, and report writing. Uh, another term Michael came up with, because a lot of the report writing stuff that you do is somewhat uh, somewhat boilerplate and based on the site record data until you get to the really fancy I'm an archaeology section I'm an archaeologist section and you can really start going to town but all the stuff before that is basically here's what we found and here's how we did it and he calls it mad libs for archaeology because it's basically just <laughs> you've got your paragraphs with your blanks and you fill that in using the data and it actually works uh, one of the big things that I'll close with here is the biggest barrier to entry most people have with going digital is buying and maintaining all these tablets and they're like well apple's going to come out with new ones in the fall i'm going to have to buy those the reason this orange box is on the screen is because that's not true anymore what we're going to do and we've got the funding for this on the way is it's going to be a monthly subscription per user and then 
we just give you the tablets. We'll give you the tablets, the batteries, the, the little scan disk things if you want those, submeter Bluetooth GPS add-on if you want that, and you never pay for any of it. If it breaks, you call us, we'll overnight you a new one with a package to send the old one back in. When Apple comes out with new tablets in the fall, we'll send you new tablets with a shipping label for that box. Say so send them back the old ones. So we've taken away that complication because um, that's the biggest thing, biggest thing I've seen talking to people is the barrier to entry. So, um, and the, the getting the new tablets every year, well, we just send you that and, and you get the shipping label back. But that's pretty much it. Um, my last question for you on Earth Day to go back to, which is today, by the way, which is to go back to that question I had on, you know, can I use tablets to kind of go digital? The question for me is um, not should you go digital, but why aren't you digital yet? This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com.